I'm going to preach to you today about the beauty of natural. The beauty of natural. Our word is found in Romans 1, verse 26. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Dear Holy God, we do pray for the presence of Thy Holy Spirit, Father. I do pray, God, that sinners will be converted unto Thee, Lord. I do pray, Father, that You would use the preaching of Thy Word, Father. Make it personal. Apply the Word, Father. Open eyes, God. And we do thank You for it, Lord. We thank You for this Holy Bible. We thank You for Your goodness, Lord. We thank You, Father, that at this hour that You are still speaking, Father, this late, dark hour... And we know that it's going to get darker, God. We ask for your light to shine, your saints to awaken, Father, and to resurrect, Father. We do thank you for your goodness and revival. And we ask, Lord, that we can do good works in these last days for you. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. The natural use into that which is against nature. Here we see that nature is something that is good. It's how God intended things to be. It's how God ordained things. It's how God made things. And although this world is cursed and we're waiting for the millennial kingdom to come and the curse to begin to be taken away, even nature is groaning, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Nevertheless, there's a way that God intended things to be, and then there's a perverted way that's unnatural, and I want to speak to you about that today. I want to begin, though, with the negative. I want to show you how we should not be natural. I want to show you when natural is bad. The first thing I want you to realize is the natural state that you are born in, children. The natural state that you are born in, is not good. It's not good. We're all born in Adam, not Jesus. We're all in need of a Savior, His atoning blood, and His righteousness. Notice Romans 5. Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned, Notice that there's condemnation passed upon all men. Your natural state is not good. You are born into this world condemned, and we are born in sin, and that natural state is not good. There's eternal condemnation for sin because Jesus is eternal, God's eternal, His law is eternal, and there's eternal punishment for sin. This is why the Lord told Nicodemus, you must be what? You must be born again. And, and he, Nicodemus is confused. Do I have to enter into the womb a second time? How can I be born again? Well, this is a spiritual birth. The first birth is a natural birth, and it's not complete. It's not good. You're born into sin. And so you need the spiritual birth where you believe upon the Savior, get your forgiveness of sin, and get everlasting life. And you must be born again for everlasting life or to get into the coming kingdom. You must have a spiritual new birth. You must have an awakening. In other words, you must believe the gospel. You must become spiritual children of God. Now, we don't want to ever give the impression that by approving of things that are natural, that I'm somehow saying that people are fine the way they are. We got that straight, right? That they do not need a Savior, that they do not need the forgiveness of sins, that they do not need the new birth. John 3.16, God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So, when I say, let's get back to nature... When I give you a sermon on the beauty of nature, I am not saying that you do not need a Savior. I am not saying that your first birth is enough for everlasting life. All right, we got that straight. Now this brings us to the second point. Not only is the natural state fallen in sin and death and eternal condemnation, but it is seen as without revelation, without the Bible, meaning the Word of God. Even the best of people in this world need the whole revelation of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? The Word of God. So we need the Word of God to be regenerated. We're ge regenerated through the Word, by hearing the Gospel and believing it. But you have to hear the Word to believe. The righteous Jews and Gentiles that you sometimes see in the Bible, every one of them still needed the Savior. Job needed the Savior. 
Noah needed the Savior. Mary needed the Savior. The parents of John the Baptist needed the Savior. They needed a sacrifice. But it's through the Word that people receive salvation. Now, you do see some people in the Bible responding to the light that's inside of them because they don't have the Bible. They have the law of God, an incomplete revelation, but nevertheless, there is a natural law that is written upon the consciences of every person. This is why God can judge mankind as fallen into sin. They can say, well, I didn't know it was sin. God, God can say, yes, you did know it was sin because I put it in your conscience to know that adultery is wrong, stealing is wrong, uh, lying is wrong, murder is wrong. All of this is in your conscience. Though everyone has sinned against this natural light that's in their hearts, and everybody needs Jesus, some are more righteous than others. Listen to me. Let's turn around and be still. Some are more righteous than others. Look at Romans chapter 2. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by what? Do by nature, not by revelation, not by the Bible, but do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law or a law unto themselves which show the work of the law written in their hearts. Now, every one of these people, even though they're obeying the law to some degree, and they're more righteous than others, they still need the Savior. You understand? And as they respond to the light that is within them, as they respond, there was an Indian over in India somewhere that was one of these gurus. And uh, people were worshiping him as a god. And one day he said, this is ridiculous, I'm not a God, and I'm not the creator of the world. And when he walked outside of his tent or whatever, a, a missionary met him and gave him the gospel. So I believe it's because he responded to that light that God opened. And the Bible says that all that are righteous in every nation, uh, that he's going to give the gospel to. And that does not mean they're righteous enough to be saved. They need the gospel that tells them that they are unrighteous and that they need a savior. Uh, think of Cornelius in the Bible. Think of the Ethiopian eunuch uh, seeking God. And I know in one sense, nobody seeks after God. Nobody seeks after God enough to be saved or justified. God sends his Holy Spirit. But uh, th these things are all in the mystery of God. This natural state, with mere natural light, is seen as incomplete. Man in his natural state needs salvation, needs the Holy Spirit, and my second point here is he needs the Holy Bible. We need the Holy Bible. So when I say let's get back to nature, I don't mean let's get back to a state without salvation. And I certainly don't mean let's get back to a state where we don't go by the Bible. We just go by what's ever in our heart. Because that's incomplete revelation, see. We need the Bible. All right. We need the Bible even after we're saved. We need to believe the Bible, hear the Bible, and obey the Bible. So all of this means that in one sense, a natural man is not good. Okay? Let's look at this in 1 Corinthians 2. But the what man? The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. An unsaved person's eyes are not open. And when they get in the Word of God, they are not going to understand it unless they're seeking and God gives them the Holy Spirit, gives them a teacher, and uh, that type of thing. But when they get the awakening, the conviction of the Holy Ghost, the illumination of the Holy Ghost, and they begin to, uh, uh, the veil falls off, the scales fall off their eyes, and they know that they are a sinner in need of Jesus, they know the Bible is the Word of God, they have faith in that book, then God will begin to open up the Bible to them, see. And the more you obey after you're saved, the more your eyes will be open. And we've gone through that in previous weeks. Uh, the more you obey, the more you yield, the more God will feed you. You respond to light, He gives you more light. You begin to get stubborn with God, He begins to take away light that you used to have. And you start falling and slipping and going the other way. It's possible for believers to live like they used to live before they were saved, when they were in the natural state. You can live like you do not have a Bible. You can make decisions as if there's no Bible. You can act like there's no manual for life. As if you're free to walk like unsaved people. 
Hey, you've been bought with a price. You're a servant of the Most High God. And what a precious price He paid for you to glorify God in your body and in your spirit. There are Christians that sometimes believe they are free to walk like unsaved people, leaning upon not the everlasting arm, not leaning upon the Bible, but leaning upon their own understanding, not acknowledging God in all their ways. And sometimes they are offended that you will call them back to the Word of God, that you will call them back to making decisions based on the Word of God, to quit living as if you're an unsaved person. In other words, we ask as obedient believers, what does Jesus say? What does God say about it in the Bible? Some people think that I'm trying to be hard or inconsiderate when I say it doesn't matter how you feel. I do not mean that nobody cares how you feel. I do not mean that we should not be sensitive to feeling. What I do mean is ultimately in the big picture, how you feel about something doesn't matter. What you think about something doesn't matter because there's a way that seems right unto a man. What I'm saying is what matters is the book. What matters is what God says about whatever it is we're trying to understand. What does God say about what you are intending to do? What does God say about what you believe? And so many times we want to be separate. We want to pretend we're this island. We want to be cut off from any accountability in the Word or to the church or whatever it might be. Because we want to get out from under the book, see? We want to pretend as if we can make decisions contrary to the Bible. No, I am bound by that book. You are bound by that book. And I've made a covenant with God. When I got baptized, uh, we supposedly left the world and said, we're going to live for God for the rest of our life. We're going to do everything we can to be His disciple. And these commands and teachings of the Scriptures are for every one of us. We're not to pick and choose. This isn't some Burger King religion. The new generation wants this a 12-step program type of God where it's God as I understand Him. I can do whatever I want. I can make up God as I understand Him. And He's a God that conforms to whatever I desire Him to conform to. He's my lap dog, my little poodle. So if by natural... We mean without faith, without salvation, or even as a believer, without our daily dependence upon the Bible in all our ways. That's not beautiful, folks. And I am not calling you to that state. I'm calling you to a spiritual state. I'm calling you to be saved, and I'm calling you as a believer to live the spiritual life, not a natural life. The title of my message is The Beauty of Nature, The Beauty of Natural. But I have to first tell you what I do not mean. Let me give you a text for all of this. 1 Corinthians 3. Amen. I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto, what? Spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Think of carnival. You get an idea what carnal is. It's flesh. Carnival. Are you not carnal and walk as men? Hey, that's not how you should walk, brother. You should walk as men. Sometimes we make decisions and I'm like, you know what? You're walking just like the world walks. You're walking like your neighbor somewhere across the street walk. You're walking like an ordinary person that doesn't have a Bible. See, you have a Bible. We ought to make our decisions as spiritual people, as mature people. We ought to make decisions based upon how does this affect others? How does this affect the Holy Spirit? How does this affect God's program? How does this affect the big picture? How does this affect what God wants to do in the lives of little ones? This is how we make decisions when you're spiritual. But when we become fleshly and backslidden and carnal, then we walk as a natural man, not as a spiritual man. We begin to pretend. That the Bible is of a private interpretation. The Bible is not of a private interpretation. The Bible says something to me and it says the same thing to Brother John here. See, when the Bible says a command in that book, that command that says thou shalt not steal, that's for me and for you, right? The commands on how to dress. That, 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 that's not some Burger King junk. You just take that and do whatever you want to with it. It's in the book. 
There's a realm and an area of liberty, but there is an area where God speaks and where He speaks, He wants everybody. I don't care what race you are. I don't care how old you are. He wants us to obey it. You understand that? It's not of a private interpretation. You don't sit home and say, what does it mean to me? What does it mean to you? Let's have a little Bible study. What does it mean to you? Now, it's one thing to, to, try, to, to, to try to study and discuss what does the Bible say. But this idea that it's personal for you, personal for you, as if it's not a book with an objective standard, that's ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. But, but, but that's... That's just part of this 12-step Burger King God that everybody wants today, you know. They want to come to church and feel holy, but what they really want is uh, the Bible's not going to mean anything to me unless I say I agree with it. 1 Corinthians 14, I'll give you an example of all of this. If they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Now, God, of course, this if you put that on a billboard today, uh, people would almost drive off the road. If pre preachers stood up and said this in their church, you would split churches across America on Sunday morning. In fact, he probably would be left with about eight people uh, in that church. I mean, this is what's going to happen all across America because we're in a backslidden, new age, Burger King generation. And uh, uh, it's full of feminists. Churches are full of feminists and weak pastors, weak men, a pastor that will be led and will not uh, uh, stand up and say, you know what? You put me here, God, to preach your word. I don't care if it's politically correct. I don't care what people say about it. I don't care how they feel about it. And uh, I need to say whatever's in the book. So this is not politically correct. It's going to make people mad. But nevertheless, it's in the book. So Paul says in the next verse, what? Came the word of God out from you or came it unto you only? What's he saying? He said, are you an apostle that's seen Jesus? Did you write the Bible? You say, well, I, I don't believe that. You know, that's not true for me. There's churches across the country who say, well, we don't believe that. We're not going to obey that. So Paul would say to them, so in other words, you write the Bible then. You must have wrote the Bible. Well, no, it just doesn't mean that to me. So it came unto you only then. It came unto you only. So, so this isn't something that we all need to look at and read and obey. See, this is what Paul's saying. Paul's saying the word of God is not a private interpretation. What I say unto you, I say unto all churches that you need to obey this. And children need to be still. It says in verse 37, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Ah, a spiritual test, a quick one. If you want to find the maturity of somebody, open up to this verse. If, you want to, if somebody says, yes, I'm a prophet, or I'm very spiritual. Uh, if somebody says to you, oh, that person down the road, he's a spiritual pastor. Call him up and say, uh, preacher, I want to read to you uh, this verse in verse 35. What do you think about women speaking in churches in the last day? See what he says. You'll find out real quick whether he's spiritual or not. You'll find out real quick whether he comes to the Bible and says, oh, it's a private interpretation for me. Uh, we're not going to follow that, see. Uh, I, I do whatever I want here, and we just make up our rules in our church according to how it fits this age that I'm living in. If any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. No, the scriptures are for all. They must be obeyed by all. And we're not permitted to make up our own teachings or our own customs if God has already addressed it. And this is where the great divide comes, church of God. This is where the division between carnal and spiritual comes in. Spiritual believers are surrendered believers. They don't go their own way. They don't go the way that seems right or the way of the crowd. They're not haughty. They're not puffed up. They're not stubborn. They're not in need of the world's praise. A spiritual believer is a surrendered believer. A spiritual believer might say, yes, I don't like that at all. No, I don't like that, nor do I understand it. But I obey it because he's my God and I bought with a price. And he told me to lay down my body as a sacrifice upon the altar. And I do what God says. He has a reason. His ways are higher than mine as the earth is, as the heaven is higher than the, 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 than the earth. So I need to follow what God says. That's what a spiritual mature believer is. And let me tell you something, people. When you're a mature believer... When you're surrendered to whatever God says, regardless of how it feels, regardless of the price that you have to pay, I tell you, Daniel and his three friends were willing to die rather than be defiled with the king's meat. Later on, he was willing to die, willing to go down. He went down into the lion. He went down into the lions rather than obey that command that said don't pray. 
He says, I don't make up my own religion around here. Whatever's in that book, that's what I follow. And I'm going to tell you something, people. When you're a mature, spiritual person, you help people. You become a blessing to people. In fact, when God went to explain, when he takes you through each days of Genesis, literal days, but also a picture for us, as he takes you through the light, the separation, the fruit bearing, the stability, the witness of the stars, uh, he takes you to that fifth day of being different than everybody, the birds and the fish. But then he takes you to that sixth day where you become a perfect man, a mature believer, and that's also the day that the beast of burdens, the sacrifices, were born. All those sacrificial animals were created. And uh, that's the six-day Christian. He, he becomes a help to people, a support, like an oxen. He, he becomes stable, able to sacrifice and help people. So you have to have a yielded believer who says, whatever God says is what I believe. Those are the people that can help the backslider when he's fallen. When somebody's slipping, those are the ones, those are the pillars on stable ground that can help somebody pull them up out of the pit. The Bible says in Galatians 6, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are carnal and natural, restore such a... That's not what it says, folks. It says, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So we need to come with humility, and we need to come uh, expecting some opposition. we got to be meek. In other words, we got to expect some opposition, but we also have to be spiritual. We have to say, you know what? If God said it, He means it, and we have better obey it. And that's the type of person that can help somebody. A person that can come and say, you know what? It says right here in Corinthians that this is how it is. It, it, it tells us what the abominations are. And I'm not playing around with the word of God. If you want to play around with the word of God, then you go ahead and do it. But I'm not playing around with the word of God. So if you want to know my opinion about something, I'm going to open up and see if God said anything about it. People might be angry. They might reject you. But when they want to hear the word of God, they're coming to you. They're coming to you. See, when they want to really be taught the word of God, they're coming to you. Because you're going to be able to help backsliders. But a woman that is an aged woman that is carnal, that is not going by the Bible. She goes by her feelings and her own stubborn self-will. She is a shipwreck to anybody that is slipping and stumbling and falling. An aged man. That is a natural man that doesn't go by the Bible, that's not surrendered to that book himself. He's going to be a nightmare to somebody that's backsliding. They're going to strengthen the hands of the evildoers. They're not going to pull them up. They're going to go down into the pit with them. If we're spiritual, we don't live by our feelings. We don't lean to our own self-will, our own understanding apart from the word. The most reasonable thing a man can do is reason with the Lord, letting the Bible be our foundation. And in this sense, to be natural is bad and ugly. Three final verses on this point, 2 Peter 2, but these are natural, as natural brute beasts. Natural, natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not. I don't understand that. Well, that's just crazy. Well, that's just stupid. Nobody does that today. That's all just crazy. You just go ahead and just blab out all of this stuff, foaming out your own shame, says the Bible. You just go ahead and keep foaming out your own shame with your stupidity, because I'm telling you, whatever God says is right and true. And when all said and done, you're going to have a bunch of angels coming down, and they're dressed right, buddy. I tell you what, when those angels come down, they're clothed down to the feet, and they're dressed right. So we can just foam out our own shame all we want. But I'm telling you, you just act like an animal. It says in Jude 1, But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts, and those things they corrupt themselves. Psalms 32 says, Be you not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with a bit and bridle. What am I telling you? I'm telling you that the natural state is incomplete. And if what you mean by nature is the unsafe state, if what you mean by nature is you want to live without the Bible, that's not a good state to be in. That's, that's basically the way the Satanist lives. 
The church of Satan says, just go by your feelings. If it feels good, do it. If you lust after something, uh, just, just go ahead and do it. Don't follow the Bible. Whatsoever thou wilt is the whole of the law. Just do what you want to do. That's Satanism. That is Satanism. You don't have to sacrifice cats or babies to be a Satanist. Just do what you want. And as Saul was told, rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. You might as well. Saul had got rid of all the witches, see. But he was rebellious. And Samuel, through the Holy Ghost, had to tell him, Hey, you might as well be a witch, Saul. You might as well be a wizard. If you're going to disobey God and be rebellious, because that is the essence of witchcraft. That is the essence of Satanism. To do whatever you want to do and say, I don't care what God said about it. Well, I, I guess we have this clear now. What I don't mean by natural. And so when I title a message, the beauty of natural, I do not mean to be without the Bible or without salvation. Okay, we got that clear. So now we can go back to what we do mean by the beauty of the natural. Look at Deuteronomy 34. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his what? His natural force abated. His natural force, his natural strength was not abated. In other words, he still had his strength all the way at 120 years old. What I'm telling you, that your natural strength, we don't want to depend upon it. We need to be aware of its limitations, but you need to also understand that it is not a good thing to purposely try to be weak. It is not a good thing to purposely try to uh, just let yourself go, to just trash your body. Caleb at 85 was as strong as he was at 40. And that's not saying much today. Because in this day and age at 40, a man's pretty much run down. But Caleb at 85 was as strong as he was at 40. And this is from clean living, from following God's plan. I know God is sovereign, but there is a general sense where what we eat and do will determine the degree of our strength. But sit still. If you walk like an Egyptian and eat like an Egyptian, you're going to be cursed like an Egyptian. Let me show it to you in Psalms 103. So when I say the beauty of the natural, I'm saying let's get back to how God intended food to be eaten. Let's get back to what God intended for us. Let's get back to the ways God intended, the ways that bless people, the ways that nourish our bodies, and not the stupidity of this age, which is basically led because the love of money is the root of all evil, and they're just trying to make money, and they probably have other agendas, which I've pointed out in the past. Psalms 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. But there's a lot of Christians that forget some of his benefits. First one you better not forget is who forgiveth all thine iniquities. I don't care how healthy you eat. I don't care how strong you want to be in your natural body. If you forget this one, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. So we better remember this benefit. We better get saved and we better come to God for daily cleansing. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. But let's move on now to this benefit that... A lot of people tend to forget who satisfies thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. So you can be like a Caleb. So you can be like a Moses. That is a promise in the word of God. God tells us what to eat and what to stay away from. And his Bible is filled with food and spices and medicine and all of these nutritious things. And he even tells you how to eat them. And he gives us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, everything we need to be healthy and happy. But the Bible says God's people account his law, brother, a strange thing. It did not profit them, says the Bible, because it wasn't mixed with faith. They didn't believe it. So what we see is that God is against the unnatural manipulation of His creation. This modern chemical chaos, this Franken-food insanity, you just type in the news and you see just the other day, top scientists hold closed meeting to discuss building a human genome from scratch. What are they doing? What are they doing? How much longer will God allow this manipulation to continue? I mean, mixing human parts with animal parts, all of this abominable, uh, wicked, demonic nonsense. And it's been going on with your food for some time now. I've been warning you about 
Uh, Monsanto's GMO, genetically modified organism technology, inserts, listen to me now, non food genes, genes from other species into the DNA of food, altering the very nature of food itself. In some cases, these genes make the crops more tolerant to Roundup herbicide made by Monsanto. And in other cases, the genes abnormally cause the DNA of food cells to produce the toxic proteins that act as pesticides. So they are manipulating corn and such like to tolerate Roundup and uh, all of these cancer-causing endocrine disruptors. And they're even changing the very nature of the plant. Folks, this is sick stuff. Talk about antibiotics and hormones and artificial flavoring. I mean, this is sick. Who knows what in the world they're sticking in this food? I mean, this is science fiction coming to reality. You know, what you have to do is you really have to get a bunch of ladies mad about things for anything to really happen. And I don't know where the women... I, I know back uh, in the early days, some women finally got mad at the liquor and they started taking baseball bats and going into bars and breaking them up, you know. And that produced uh, basically prohibition. I mean, the whole world woke up and said, okay, we got to stop with some of this liquor and everything. Well, when women finally wake up and get mad about something, praise God, they can get a lot done. And I don't know where the mamas have been. I know where they've been. They've been deceived. They've been deceived. And uh, they're, they're supposed to love their children, but yet they're, they're giving their children things that, that corrupt them and hurt them. Well, finally now, finally, there's an organization. I don't know much about them. I'm not for everything they probably stand for. But I am very pleased, and I say it's about time, that an organization called Moms Across America have awakened. And they've been putting billboards all across America now. And uh, the billboards say... Uh, where is it? Our children get better when they eat organic. Notice how they had to phrase that, see? They had to phrase it in such a way that they don't get legal fallout. But they are being attacked. And it's basically saying you're a good mom if you don't give your child manipulated, uh, if you don't manipulate God's creation and put a bunch of pesticides and things all over their food. <coughs> They're healthier. They don't get the cancers as much. Now, what you see is Big Pharma is attacking them like crazy. Forbes newspaper, who's always the one who comes out to try to defend Big Pharma and Big Money, they're coming out and attacking these mothers. But praise God for them and what they are doing. Now, beware that because something says natural on the front of the package that doesn't mean it's good somebody says oh well i eat natural chicken and we eat natural peanut butter i mean you got to look in the back of it and see what in the world's inside this stuff natural can mean anything today you understand it there's even a movement now that's beyond organic and that's a good thing the whole point is we need to eat food that is not using human waste and pesticides and genetic manipulation and antibiotics and such like can we try to find food and eat it the way god intended it to be eaten that will bring the blessing that will bring the blessing. And praise God, you say something long enough, and it seems that nobody's listening. And finally, God will just finally say, forget it. If the Christians aren't going to wake up, I'll give it to the world. I'll give it to the world. I'll find somebody that will stand up and start warning people. And it's so sad, so sad that Christians want to be the tail end instead of the leader. See, God will awaken a preacher and try to call a church to repentance and try to make that church a leader of uh, 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 and. Basically shine the light on something long before the world ever gets it. But then Christians are stubborn. They're stubborn and they sit back and they say, well, the world's not following it. And my aunt's not following it. And, and uh, my next door neighbor's not following it. And when everybody else starts following it, then maybe I'll start listening. You know what? Many times Christians are still way back here, way back here. Talk about the tail end. They're way back there. And, and the world has to say, you're a Christian and you don't even know these things. It's very sad, people. It is very, very sad to be last in line in that way. God says, I call you to be the head and not the tail. But, you know, uh, we, I'll talk about that later. It's the propaganda. It's the control. And there's a reason that we think this way. Now, 1 Corinthians 11 says, Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. Oh, yes. The beauty of natural. Paul says, why don't you just go by nature? 
you don't even need the Bible when it comes to this. You don't need the Bible to know that a man shouldn't have long hair. You don't need the Bible to know that a woman ought to have long hair. For her hair is given to her for a covering. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. What he's not saying is, but if you want to cut your hair short, ladies, go ahead and do it. What he's not saying is, man, if you want to have long hair, we don't really have a custom about it. I told you that the Bible teaches it and even nature teaches it, but really we don't care. That's not what he's saying. When he says we have no such custom, what he's saying is this. He's saying the same thing that he says in 1 Corinthians 14. What came the word of God out from you or came it unto you only? In other words, this isn't up to private interpretation. We're going to do what God says. And if you want to be ignorant, go be ignorant. But I'm calling the churches to follow what God says in this matter. And you ought to be ashamed of yourself because even nature shows you that a woman ought to have long hair and a man should not. Well, after years of preaching, I'm somewhat encouraged that there is now a back to nature movement in food and lifestyle. Back to the basics of life. And as many continue to become even more plastic and perverted, it causes a reaction, my brother. It causes a reaction where many begin to wake up and they say, I'm sick of plastic. I'm sick of plastic women. I'm sick of this fake artificial look. I'm sick of everything looking gross. And I'm just sick of plastic. And they begin to, re they begin to go against this natural, I'm sorry, this artificial beauty, this toxic beauty. And uh, praise God, people are starting to awaken. Not just in regard to food, but in regard to beauty, believe it or not. The natural beauty movement is... Increasing like you would not believe all over the world in every country almost. And again, I will remind you, many years ago, people would say, why? What is it about your women there in that church? I mean, they're so sweet. What is it? And I would tell them it's, it's natural beauty. And even though I want them to go even further, what you're doing is you're seeing a contrast between the artificial and the artificial is not beautiful. It's plastic and gross. And you're seeing natural beauty the way God intended it. And I pray that the women continue and grow in it and that the daughters that are coming up learn it and they grow in it and they become a light to the world. You take your daughters into a place and everybody stops and they just get this comfortable feeling, the men and the women, and they say, what is it? I say, well, it's, you're seeing long hair. You're seeing long and flowing garments. You're not seeing a bunch of makeup and lipstick and things. You're seeing beauty the way God intended it. And it's very wholesome, very sweet, very comforting. It's like a flower. So I've been calling women to this, to, to be the leaders in this thing. Take control of it and be excited about it. Be bold. Be willing to, to take what God says and show the world what natural beauty is. A lot of people, though, have, uh, have been upset about this. And now, all of a sudden, again, God says, so you don't want to be the head? You don't want to be the leaders? I'll give it to the world. I'll give it to the world. They'll take lead. And how sad it is. How sad it is. Then a lot of Christians will say, oh, okay. So it's okay now that everybody's doing it. So now I can do it. What I'm trying to say to you people is that really frustrates me about Christians. It just frustrates me. Why don't you have the boldness to stand for God and be a leader? Why do you have to wait for the world to get it before you ever wake up? It's frustrating to me. Because I believe we ought to be leaders. And I'm calling you to be a leader. I'm calling this church to be a leader if God is pleased. But what happens is, God will speak through an ass if He has to. When Israel, who knew the Scriptures, who had God's law, would not speak for God, God says, I'll raise up the Gentiles. And those, those Israelites are very offended. They're like, those are dogs. You're going to use dogs? And God says, yeah, I'm doing that to humble you. I'll use a bunch of Gentile dogs to preach and I'll give them the truth of the, of the cross and everything and, and they'll preach to you and humble you. Well, you know what? Don't think God won't do the same thing to Christians. See, God will take that hippie world out there and give them the truth if you won't take it. Now, they're blind as a bat if they don't have the Bible, but sometimes they grab a hold to pieces of truth that... Other Christians have neglected. And it's a shame. It's a shame because we should not have neglected it. 
Things got so fake and plastic that a new movement of sorts was launched in the world somewhere around 2014. Of course, we were over a decade ago trying to tell people to let's eat natural food the way God intended. Let's have natural beauty the way God intended. And let's get away from the plastic look, the plastic clothes, the plastic food. Get the plastic off your face. Let's get the clown paint and the circus look. Let's just get rid of all of that. And let's just be beautiful for God. Now, finally, around 2014, pop singers who I do not endorse. I just I never even knew their names. I just was typing in back to natural beauty movement. And uh, I found out this thing's exploded all over the place. There's all these songs I never even knew were there. Songs with lyrics that say, why should you care what they think of you? Take your makeup off. Let your hair down. It's still pop psychology, love yourself stuff. It's still saying because you're beautiful the way you are. But, you know, there's a sense in which they're right. If you take out the pop psychology, the way God intended you to be is beautiful. You understand that? It's beautiful. And and most men secretly know this. And if if you don't believe me, go under the comments. Uh, uh, take, Take a movement like these Mormon polygamous ladies. God forbid they were wicked into polygamy and things. But, you know, they, they were dressing sweet and had long hair. Look at the comments sometimes on these news articles of what the men say. Uh, whenever somebody shows up in public and it's getting real popular for women to want to be seen without their makeup in public, they go shopping without their makeup and there's some star or some model. And it's like a big fad now to be seen without your makeup. And they get these pictures and, and all the men at the bottom. Wow, she looks so much better, so much more beautiful. And men want the natural look. Women normally wear that stuff for other women. Women normally cut their hair for other women. It's more of a personal empowerment thing. It's like that Meg, whatever her name is, she says, I cut my hair for power. You know, you look like a lesbian lady. I mean, what what are you doing? And so this is the problem today. Now, what it really is, is a protest. Many in the world are waking up and they're protesting. They're saying, forget the plastic, forget the artificial I'm protesting this and praise God for their protest. (laughs) And, And there's varying degrees of this protest, but they're protesting plastic people, plastic food and plastic toxic beauty. The natural look is becoming increasingly popular. Um, there's even now a video movement and a blog movement all over the internet. It's taken, it's going through all the various countries by storm. It's called the Brave and Beautiful Movement, where women are being seen on video, take your makeup off. And it's showing them with their makeup and then they're taking it off and they're daring to show themselves without their makeup. They're embracing their natural beauty. And uh, basically... They are challenging one another. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? Why don't you be beautiful the way God intended? What are you afraid of? And some of these women, you would think that they're about to jump off of a cliff. They're like, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to take my makeup off and show myself in public. And this is all part of this movement, this back to nature. Nature is beautiful movement. And uh, it's very good. Now I say, let's go further, ladies. Uh, Let's just speak to the worldly ladies. Go further. Now dare to be modest. Dare to be feminine. Dare to go against the feminist. And dare to put clothes on and be modest and pure and not trashy. I dare you. I've been daring Christian ladies for years. I I dare the world now. I dare you. And many of these will do it. They'll do it. See, many will say... Well, I want to be naked because that's natural. No, folks. No, no. Not for a person. It's not natural for a person to be naked. You understand? Uh, When a man was devil possessed, he didn't have any clothes. But when he was in his right mind, he was clothed. When you see those angels, they're clothed down to their feet. They're clothed down to their feet. When they see Jesus, he's clothed. See? No, no. It's not normal and natural to be naked. See? Um... Not now. So there is a green beauty movement. And the green beauty movement is naturally leading more people to embrace natural beauty. Uh, One person says, I've noticed that when people become aware and educated about how their beauty purchases are affecting their health, they begin to relax into a more holistic look or holistic way. In other words, they start by saying, I don't want to stick that on my face. 
I don't want to stick these chemicals. I don't want these endocrine disruptors that are going to raise my testosterone or whatever it is. I'm not going to put this on my body. I'm not going to give myself breast cancer. I'm not going to. And so then all of a sudden, it's not long before they say, why am I even doing this to begin with? If my products are more natural, why don't I dress natural? Why don't I look natural? Why do I even need all this plastic? And praise God for that. Praise God for it. Last month, just to show you where we're at, one popular women's fashion magazine had a headline in Google News that said something like, there's a natural beauty movement sweeping the world. I mean, here's these popular fashion magazines that have been leading the way in plastic artificial beauty are now trying to get in on it, see. One blogger says, I felt glad to be part of this natural health, natural beauty movement and to see so many like-minded people getting involved now. Hey, let me tell you something, ladies. Classy and pure will never be out of style. Never. It does not go out of style. It can't go out of style because it's natural. It's beautiful. And the more plastic and gross things become, the more people become half machine, half plastic, plastic noses, plastic chins, plastic everything else, the more plastic and automated and mechanical things become, the more valuable, the more wonderful and amazing and glorious the way God intended things to be will become. See? There's something about seeing an apple that worms will eat that's beautiful, folks. <laughs> but there's something about that glossy apple that's plastic. There's something's wrong with it, see? And uh, it doesn't look like food. And um, now, you know, this back to nature movement really started, get to the country movement. Uh, it started in the 1960s and spread to the 1970s. And part of it was related to the hippies. A book came out, the Encyclopedia of Country Living. It was spawned out of that movement. And what happened is, is it kind of trickled and kind of maintained itself. And then all of a sudden, Y2K connected it. So all that back to the country, back to nature, hippie movement of the 1960s and 70s, it mixed with the preparedness crowd and the Y2K apocalyptic get ready for Jesus to come crowd. And uh, all of that basically has now come together in one big giant back to nature movement. And I'm just saying, the back to natural beauty is connected with it all. Let's get away from food that's making you sick. Let's get away from toxic beauty. Now, let me show you what happened. When the hippies, in some ways, first went back to nature, you know what it caused many churches to do? So, Paul, it caused many churches to say, if the hippies are doing it, I don't want to do it. And if they're going back to the country, we'll move to the city. And if they're going to eat organic and natural, then I'll go to McDonald's because I don't want to be a hippie. Now, that's stupid, isn't it? Isn't that stupid? That's just plain stupid. But many times that's how Christians react, see. And that's how the devil keeps getting us. So some hippies basically say, well, I'm going to start growing my own food. I'm going to get out of this corporate food thing and I'm going to quit putting chemicals on my food and, uh, and I'm going to start. And then and now if you're into herbs and into being healthy, uh, some people still, mainly among the aged, think you're a hippie. Because that's how they connect it, see, in their mind. Uh, if hippies grew beards, many of the churches said, we don't want beards on our preachers or on our men. Like, why? Jesus had a beard. And they just all of a sudden stare at you just kind of blank, you know. It's like, wait a second. Why shouldn't you have a beard? Well, because hippies have beards. Well, the hippies are right then. You know, not that you have to have a beard, but I'm just telling you it's more natural, you know. Now, here's one problem. In the Bible, they shaved or trimmed their beards, a better word. They trimmed their beard. Remember, it says Mephibosheth, uh, he did not trim his beard the whole time David was gone. That shows that it's normal for a man to trim his beard. Now, Nebuchadnezzar did not trim his beard or his hair or his nails for seven years. Why? Because he was a madman. He lost his mind. So what happens is you started having these men in the 1960s with these beards 
out to here, their hair out to here. They look like Nebuchadnezzar. The only difference is they were half dressed like a woman. So it's even more hideous. It's a Nebuchadnezzar who's gone insane that's dressed like a woman. Ah! And so a lot of these Baptist preachers look at that and they say, "Uh uh-uh, we're shaving off our whole beard and everything. Well, no, now you're going to another extreme. Just trim the beard up a little bit. Cut the hair short. Take the women's clothes off. And now you got it. You got what we should be as men. Um, So it would have been right for churches to say you should not have long hair if you're a man. And you shouldn't let your beards grow like eagle's feathers. There's nothing wrong with that. Mat it all together and everything, you know. But many went the other way. And they shunned beards. Why? Because the hippies had them. Hey, it didn't stop there, folks. Hippies had herbs and gardens and natural food, so now we're just going to go to McDonald's. Hippies had beards, so now we're going to be clean shaven. Uh, Women hippies had long skirts, so we're going to put our skirts up to our knee. And not only that, hippie women don't wear makeup, so we're going to put on a bunch of makeup. So isn't this about stupid? Isn't this about stupid? Here you've got the Christian fundamental Baptist women with their skirts shorter than the hippie women, their men having their hair on their, on their face all trimmed off, all shaved off. They're eating artificial food and junk food. I mean, junk food among many Baptist churches became the fourth person of the Trinity, you'd almost think. I mean, really, it did. It got exalted to almost as if there's a fourth person of the Trinity. Junk food was it. I mean, it was a cardinal fundamental of the faith. Why? In protest to the hippies. And so now the, hippie, the, the, the Christian women are getting all plastic up because they don't want to look like a hippie woman. Folks, I'm telling you, that's just wrong. And praise God now, it's gone so far that Christians are starting to wake up. And uh, Now, it's true. If you ask those people back in the 70s, they'll say, well, the hippies don't take baths. They don't take baths. They don't bathe. They don't wear makeup. They don't bathe. And uh, so guess what? Well, well, then let's bathe. Amen. Let, let, let's clean. Let's be clean. But is artificial necessarily good because hippies were natural? That doesn't make any sense. And I know in many ways the hippies took natural too far. They said, oh, marijuana is natural. Then we ought to just smoke pot because it's natural. No, you're not. Understand. It's not natural to pervert your brain. You understand that? That's not natural. LSD ain't natural. So many of the hippies finally got off at least a lot of their drugs. And, uh, but the way they're thinking, their mysticism, all of that, their cross-dressing, uh, their LSD, their drug culture, all of that is bad. But I'm just saying <coughs> the back-to-nature movement was right. It was right. It was right. Now, Lester Roloff got in on it a little bit and tried to tell the fundamental Baptists, hey, this stuff about food's not wrong, and you need to start listening. But he was shut down by a lot of people, and they just said, well, he's just crazy. You know, no, he was right. He was right. He might not have been right on every little detail about food, but I'm going to tell you something. He was right about getting back to natural the way God intended things. Hey, folks, a copperhead is natural, but I don't want to eat one. Do you? I don't want to kiss one either. It was right for these preachers to stand against nudity and LSD and marijuana and worshiping the earth and long hair on men and cross-dressing and perverted, unbalanced trance music and fornication. It was right to stand against all of that, but it was a great error to basically, since hippie women are taking off their makeup, church women are going to go crazy with it like Jezebel's and rent their faces by painting, as Jeremiah, or as the Bible warned. The Bible says they rent their faces, that they, they tear up their faces by putting all these things on their face. For thousands of years, Church of God, you had a good idea who was a good girl. The marrying kind. Remember Paul in the New Testament says, I want you women to dress like good girls, uh, uh, women professing godliness, not like the harlots. I want you to wear modest clothing. In other words, I want you to be a domestic woman that somebody would marry. Uh, if, if you are married, I want you to look like it and act like it and not be like one of those harlot women. That's what the New Testament says. And for thousands of years, you knew who the bad girls were. You did. You knew. And when that adulterous woman secretly was meeting that man in the Bible, it says she had the attire of a harlot on sea. 
But now the very strange thing, the very strange thing is that the harlots don't know what to do anymore. Because the domestic so-called good girls, the housewives, are dressed just like them in many ways. And it's very confusing. It wasn't always this, th th this confused. Back in the 60s, just to show you how bad things have changed, just from the late 60s, there was a female country singer and she sang a hit song. It says, I've never seen the inside of a bar room, but I see that these are things that bring you pleasure. If you like them painted up and powdered up, then you ought to be glad because your good girl is going to go bad. Now that's wicked. No woman should respond to an adulterous, drunken man by saying, I'm just going to go be worldly myself. But it's very interesting that in 1967, she basically defined a good girl as not being painted up. And she said, I tell you what, if, if you like women like that, then I'm going to go get painted up. That was a popular hit song in 1967. I tell you, we've gone a long way, folks. We've gone a long way. But praise God, there are now, uh, there's now a back to nature movement and... The world got shocked. This is, this is something else that's causing people to wake up. The world was shocked not long ago, a few years ago, to hear reports of so-called aborted fetal tissue in certain cosmetics. Cosmetics. What a slap in the face of motherhood. Here, ladies, put this on and it make you pretty as you're rubbing abortion all over your face, you know, in some ways. What a sin against natural affection. See, cosmetic companies don't have to list their ingredients. At least one company is still open about it to this day. Yeah, we use that stuff in here. They're open about it. Then came reports of so-called aborted fetal tissue being used for flavorings and enhancers in processed foods. When it says artificial ingredient, they can put anything under that artificial ingredient. It's just a catch-all for whatever they want, really. Not long ago, Planned Parenthood was exposed for selling dead babies. Who do you think they're selling them to? Folks, it wasn't all for research. It's because people use those babies for research, for development of cosmetics and artificial flavorings and things like that. And uh, when people start shining the light on it, then it kind of backs off, you know. But U.S. News and World Report said uh, just last year, uh, not many months ago, because the Food and Drug Administration does not require cosmetic companies to list ingredients, it's difficult to quantify whether or how often fetal tissue is used to develop them. Are they in your vaccines? You know, people get vaccines. Is you're getting cell lines uh, that come from abortions uh, because they say they argue. They'll tell you right out, even in Snopes, which you can't trust that wicked site. But even Snopes uh, will, will quote one of these fellows responding and saying, well, human viruses don't, don't work well in animal cells. We have to use the aborted cell lines. And so whether it's vaccines or whether it's these foods, I, I think Christians ought to get away from these things, whether they have abortion parts in them or, or whether they were used, research with aborted parts. I, I think there's enough intricate disrupting problems uh, and cancer causing problems to get away from them. But I'm just letting you know what's waking up everybody. I'm letting you know where the movement's coming from. Uh, uh, people are getting reports like this and they're saying, I'm not sticking this stuff on my face anymore. And it's not long after they're not sticking it on their face. They're like, well, what do I use? What do I use? And pretty soon they say, why do I even need anything? Everybody's telling me I look good or, or that you look good this way. And, and, and they're, they're getting bold, you know. I think it's past time to get back to God-created, God-ordained, natural living as much as possible in all parts of our life. Which brings us to some quick verses for you as I close. Romans 1, For this cause God gave them up into vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Here, against nature is bad. And likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. You know, the nations are mad today. Did you hear that Obama is now threatening all public schools, saying that he's going to withdraw federal aid from them? Uh, you know what? There, there could be a bigger blessing for a school than to not have any federal aid. You understand that? I mean, j just get away from all of that. Go back to teaching. I mean, better yet, get out, get, get the government out of schools to begin with. I mean, w w why do we have a federal school, a public education system anyway? But um, anyway, he's saying if you don't allow boys that are dressed like girls to go into school women's restroom, girls' restrooms, then we're going to punish you. It's insane. It's insane. Hey, it's against nature, folks. 
But this is where we finally are. I want some Christians around the country. I want some people to just stop and ask, how did we get here? How did we get here? So back when the preachers were warning you that you ought not even take that first step toward uh, confusing the sexes. Don't even take that first step. Now here's where we're at. Fort Worth is leading the nation. Isn't this interesting? Fort Worth is leading the nation saying, we'll take the first step. We're going to allow it in all of our schools. We're going to allow perverts to go into the bathrooms in Fort Worth schools. We're going to take the lead. Isn't that something? Cowboy Town is going to lead the nation in pervert schools, in this perverted uh, practice. You know, Fort Worth was not without preaching. You understand that? This church labored and labored and labored. Uh, we labored and labored and were called every name you could imagine to try to give Fort Worth that last final warning. And then finally we left. We left. We left. And here we are, folks. Here we are. Fort Worth is a sewer at this time. It is a moral sewer. And it's going to reap the judgment. Because when you do this, it's going to lead to all kinds of hell and the Bible says the nations that forget God shall be turned into hell. And you better believe the cities that forget God. It already became a sanctuary town for all types of gangs and people pouring across the border, a sanctuary city. Let me show you something else. Second Timothy 3. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come for men, sh men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, Blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. That's good. See, it's normal for mamas. They're supposed to naturally love their children. You're supposed to love your wife, love your husband. That's natural, not love somebody else. See? I'm going to tell you what, you middle-aged folks, start loving your wife more and love your husband more. and Don't, don't let nothing come between you like that. Don't drift away. Love one another. Don't have some midlife crisis and go crazy. You're going to regret it later, folks. You're going to regret it. Love your husband. Love your wife. Let's have natural affection. Love your children. Love them enough to spank them. Love them enough to teach them what's right, to not be selfish. Love them enough to be home with them and take care of them. They only get one childhood. Devote yourself to them. That's what this church is about. Truce breakers, even if you got to be poor. The Bible says if you got to eat a bunch of beans and vegetables and have love in your house, that's what's important, see? That's better. That's better. That's better. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fear, despisers of those that are good. And you know the list. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. I'm telling you ladies, if you don't get control of your emotions... Somebody is going to come creeping. See, you stay in that bitter state and get yourself all stirred up. Somebody's going to come creeping in. Somebody's going to come creeping in. Watch out. Watch out. Philippians 2. My last verse for you today. So we've got that sodomy is against nature. Lesbianism is against nature. Natural affection is a good thing. Men having short hair and women having long hair is a beautiful thing. It's right. Let me give you my last verse. Philippians 2, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly unto you that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. This is an amazing statement by Paul. He says, I have a few Christians with me. I know of a few Christians, but I don't have anybody like Timothy. He said, I have one man, Timothy, that I can trust to send to you. Because there's one thing about Timothy that's different from a lot of Christians. Number one, he stayed with me while I'm in prison. He wasn't afraid. He's not afraid of persecution. He's not afraid to identify himself as a Christian. He's a bold, godly, God-fearing young man. But he said, let me tell you one more thing about Timothy. I don't have any man that thinks like he thinks. I don't have any man that will naturally care for you. Naturally. Why did Paul use the word naturally? What does he mean, naturally care for you? Webster defines affectation 
as an attempt to assume or exhibit what is not natural or real, a false pretense, artificial appearance or show. So what's he saying about Timothy? He's saying Timothy's not plastic. Timothy is genuine. He really cares about you. He really cares about God. He really cares about the coming of the Lord. He, he is genuinely doing these things because he believes in God and believes in what we're doing. He's not fake. He's not just playing church. He's not just trying to make money. He's not just trying to appear righteous. Timothy was sincere, natural. So I guess as I close, Church of God, now that everybody's doing it, it's not much of a glory for you to do it now. But I'm going to tell you something. It's still right. It's still right. At least get on the tail. At least get on the hind end. Okay? You might have missed being the head in this thing, but, but at least catch a hold of the tail and be carried along by the movement. Okay? Um, let's be... Let's get back to nature and our food to whatever degree you can. You will be blessed and one day you will be so thankful as others receive the curses, you will be so thankful that you did. Let's get back to natural beauty in our dress. And in regard to our godliness, let it not be artificial and plastic. Hey, you can even fake godliness. You can come in dressed right and eat right and be wicked in your heart and have some wicked motives. Let's not be plastic. Let's, let's, let's let our love be real, brother and sister. For the right reason. I'm calling us to not be plastic Christians. And I think I've been really actually doing that for 20 years. I'm calling you not to be a plastic Christian. I don't want plastic food. I don't like looking at plastic women. And I don't like hypocrites. God gave women a natural beauty. And no matter what age you are, there's some ladies that have the most beautiful long hair and they're so bold and, and, and it's gray and gorgeous. And, and every time I see one of them, I tell them how beautiful they are. Embrace the beauty that God gave you. Dear Holy Father, we do pray that you'll help us in whatever way we can to understand the dangers in this toxic beauty, this toxic plastic food. And God, you've told us that many Christians in the last days, many people in general will have a form of godliness, a plastic godliness that won't even be real. Father, they'll love pleasure more than you. God, help this church, however small it is, however big you ever cause it to be, help its influence to be Far and wide, God, enlarge our borders. Give us more funds, Lord, to do more, to build the retreat that we want to have here for many Christians to come, to be with their families, Lord, whether they move here or whether they just come and visit and get refreshed. Let us build that up for them, Father. Let us get RV hookups and cabins for them to, to stay in, Lord. And, and just help us, Father, to continue the vision and work that you've given for us here, Lord. And help us, Lord, with these sermons and whatever other ways we can, Father, to Sopex coming documentary that he's about to put out. Uh, our personal witnessing in our area, our neighborhood, Lord. Uh, let us use this natural food and natural beauty, Lord, as a witnessing tool, Father. And so many times, God, it's opened the door for me to share the gospel and to talk to people about deeper things. And, and I just pray that you'll help us, Lord, to be a leader. And Father, to save lives, to save lives, to save people from hormonal crisis, Lord, to save people from cancers, and, and to be strong, Father, even in their elderly years. Help us, God, to be this light. I thank you for the ladies of this church, Lord. I do so much, Father. 
I thank you for their faithfulness, their loyalty, their, their godliness. I thank you, Father, for the young ones that have come up and have done right and have been so strong, Lord, and such a godly example. And I do pray, Father, that you continue this work, continue our vision here, Father, and save our children, bring back the backsliders, heal those that need healing, Lord, spiritually and physically, and uh, let us get to the work. The hour is late. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Any word, dear brother?